uh, I'd like to thank the organizer and also the program committee for giving me this invitation. It's really an honor to be able to speak to all of you here in ICAP. Uh, my name is Ping Khoi Lam. I'm from the Australian National University. Uh, I work in the Center for uh, Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. Um, uh, here's a, a photo of my group. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention Michael Hush and Harry Stetcher, who has since moved on to industry. They are the two of the people who make the uh, neural network uh, computer code. And uh, special mention to the very talented postdoc Jeff Campbell and Aaron Trenter is the first author. And Ben Buckler and I uh, managed the program together. So the overview of my talk is going to be, I'm going to get, give a really quick um, description of our rubidium magneto-optical trap that is used for gradient echo memory. And then I'm introduce a neural network um, and then show how we implement uh, deep learning on our magneto-optical trap, show you some results, and hopefully we have time for some discussion and conclusion. So the gradient echo memory that we normally use for storing uh, quantum information um, is, can be explained by uh, looking at this situation where uh, longitudinally we can set up uh, uh, an increasing or decreasing atomic detuning, and this can be implemented using Zeeman shift or stack shift. And if we were to send a light through, then the light will be absorbed uh, by Fourier decomposing itself longitudinally uh, into the different spectral components along the length of the uh, cigar mod. If we were to flip the magnetic field, then what happened is that the block vector would then precess um, uh, in a time reverse manner. And for an equal time later, light will couple out of the sample in the forward direction. The good thing about the echo memory is that uh, there will be no reabsorption uh, as the light tries to escape the sample because of the monotonic uh, increasing or decreasing frequency decomposition. Uh, ideally, the Efficiency of this kind of gradient echo memory is 100%, provided that if you have a very large optical depth and your atomic uh, coherence is uh, very long. So our, our objective is then to increase the uh, atomic uh, density. So if you look at the Maxwell block equation, uh, all we do is we just add one extra term uh, here. And, but performing a Fourier uh, transformed to the system, what we see is that there exists a polyaritonic description that's very similar to the EIT system that's described by Fleshhau and Lukins. So there is polaritons in our gradient echo memory, except it lived in the K space rather than in real space. So we have used the uh, gradient echo memory to implement quite a number of schemes. We've demonstrated that the efficiency from input to output, the total efficiency can be approaching 90%. Uh, we have used it to store quantum information. And for a light state that has got alpha approximately 1, that's near to the single photon state, we can have a quantum fidelity of larger than 90%. And then also, because of the polaritonic nature of our memory, you can actually put in, say, seven pulses of light and arbitrarily resequence the output of the pulses. Uh, in this case, we can show that you can have 4, 3, 5, 6, 2, 1 coming out. Um, if you were to turn on a counter-propagating control field, um, then you have two control field uh, uh, counter-propagating with each other. You can also set up stationary light. So these are light that's trapped inside the sample. They're not a, a atomic coherence, but they're actually uh, electromagnetic excitation. And the condition for setting up uh, stationary light is that you need to integrate along the length of the, the gas cell, uh, along the length of the mod, and get the atomic uh, polarization to integrate to zero. So we call this uh, self-stabilizing stationary light. So here's a complete schematic of what we normally do uh, with our uh, rubidium magneto-optical trap. It's a process schematic. You can use it to store light using EIT, using gradient echo memory, or you can implement stationary light. But all of this requires the preparation of having very, very large uh, optical density so that you can increase the efficiency and get all the processes to work ideally. 
So for the remainder of the talk, I will only focus on the loading phase and the transient compression. And this is where we're going to implement the machine learning for our experiment. So the control parameters for laser cooling uh, has already been studied uh, quite a lot, uh, as, as early as uh, close to 30 years ago by uh, Daliba um, and, and Kohn Tanuji, and um, there's many papers. And all these are analytical solutions. So we, we think we understand the process quite well. However, we always make the assumption that it's in the low density regime and some sort of steady state has been reached in your magneto-optical trap. And some of this expression, for example, the density scaling uh, in 3D is very much geometric uh, dependent. So the trapping field, the repump field, the magnetic field strength, we know what to do with them, but not really precisely in a, in a real high OD transient situation. So let's have a look at uh, our magneto-optical trap. We have uh, elongated coils. Um, to, to produce an elongated cigar mod. And then we have capping coils at the end as well. So what we do is, for the loading phase, we just turn on the trapping, the repump, and the coil current constant, and slowly load up uh, uh, the rubidium atoms. And then we start the uh, transient compression phase by ramping the detuning of the repump away and then increase the coil current so that you can actually compress the mod. So, um, so this is the basic schematic, and I guess everyone thinks that this works reasonably well. We can rely on adiabatic approximation by not moving everything suddenly. Um, so what we do is, uh, in our experiment, we digitize this part of the process into 21 time settings, so that each of the settings is one millisecond. And the final point of our trapping is set to the polarization gradient cooling uh, detunings. Um, so now let's have a, this uh, 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 switch of topic. Uh, we'll look at the biological neuron. So this is a picture of a biological neuron. Um, what we want to pay special attention to is the dendrite, which is the input of the biological neuron, and the axon, which is the transmitter of the information, and the synaptic terminals, which is the output of your uh, neurons uh, signal. So if you look at it, depending on where you find the neurons in, in an animal's uh, body, some of the larger neurons can have up to 100,000 connections, uh, 100,000 input going into the neurons. But there's always one axon that's, that's uh, transmitting the signal. And the speed of the transmission is equal to the, similar to the uh, ele electrical transmission. So an artificial neuron is more or less the same. You can just connect as many input as you want to your, uh, your artificial neuron. And then you need to select the activation function. Uh, you can have this uh, uh, very, very straight, flat transition, or you can slowly change it. And what we discover is that depending on your activation function, it actually affects the efficacy of your artificial neural network quite a lot. And then obviously you have an output, and your output can be used to control further neurons down the stream, or in the end, um, give you some results that you try to simulate or calculate. Um, so here's an example of uh, constructing an environmental response. Let's say you want to create a pulse. Uh, what we can do is we start off with inputs, and we can put weights on the input. So in this case, the top one is 0.5, and the bottom one is 1, and then you choose a an activation function. In this case, it's just hyperbolic tangent. And you can time shift the, the trigger as well. So the bottom function is actually triggered slightly later than the top one. And then by recombining, you can also swap the polarity of the trigger function. And then you end up getting, say, a pulse at the output. So this is a two-neuron two uh, network. So deep neural network learning it has been applied to big data in a really, really uh, uh, scary way. Uh, um, every, everything that we, we look at in big data, uh, there's someone who is working on some kind of a, a artificial neural network. Healthcare, imaging processing, data security, finances. Uh, what I've shown here is the self-driving car. So this is a project on how to use neural net to help us to learn self-driving. And here, this is a very interesting work by the group from Tübingen, where they teach the neural net to paint like Turner, like Picasso, like Kandinsky by showing them a picture of Tübingen, 
and then showing them the, pro the, the, the uh, works of Picasso, they will be able to figure out how to do it. Uh, an even scarier example is uh, deep neural net chess playing. So this is Alpha Zero versus Stockfish. Stockfish is now the world champion. The top 20 chess players are all neural networks, any, uh, all computer programs anyway. So Stockfish still make use of uh, the traditional uh, algorithm-based uh, uh, chess playing scheme, whereas uh, Alpha Zero is using deep learning via the neural network. Now, Alpha Zero is not taught any of the chess opening. In four hours, it learned how to play chess itself and then play with Stockfish, who is the current world champion. And the result is that Alpha Zero won 28 matches, drew the remainder, and has never lost. Um, and the really scary statistic is that Alpha Zero only looked at 80,000 positions, whereas Stockfish looked at 70 million, and yet it's still losing. And the reason is that the focus is much more selective. I don't know how the neural net does it, but this is the upshot. So machine learning has also been done in science. In as early as 1998 and 2000, there are already a couple of papers on how you can put in-loop learning by using uh, evolutionary nonlinear algorithm uh, as a feedback to control your experiment. And more recently, there has also been work using uh, artificial neural net to uh, do quantum state tomography and also classification of quantum states. So what we want to do now is to use artificial neural net deep learning in an in-loop situation to optimize our magneto-optical trap. So this four panel basically describe what we are working on. We have the experimental panel, the artificial neural net panel, and how we analyze the result, and then how we feed back to the experiment. So our experiment, as I've described before, we turn on the, uh, the, the two fields to uh, do transient compression, and the, scheme, the transition is shown here using the D2 transition uh, from F equals to 2 to f, equals to f prime equals to 3, f equals to 1 to f prime equals to 2. And then we turn it off, and then we optically pump all of this to the f equals to 1 state, and then finally we use the D1 transition uh, using a detuned uh, probe laser to measure the optical density in the end. So once we have acquired the, the optical density reading, um, we need to look at the artificial neural net by first setting up a cost function. So the cost function is basically the thing that we are trying to optimize. So in this case, our cost function is just a time integral of the transmission of our uh, probe beam. So obviously, the lower the trans transmission means that the higher the optical density. And we just put in a scaling factor to take into account that there sometimes can be some kind of fluctuations in your, in your input uh, laser. And then the training data is collected and then it's given to the artificial neural net. So the artificial neural net that we set up is consisting of uh, 63 inputs. So these are the 20 time steps, so 21 data points times the three parameters that we're trying to control. And then we connect them up uh, into a five-layer 64 neurons network, and then we get every single neurons to, to connect up with each other, so that's 64 squares times five. Finally, all of this is reconnected back to one output, and that, that output will give you the cost function. <clears throat> so we, why stop at using one when you can just cut and paste and create another neural net? So we decided to use three neural nets to optimize our, our experiment. And then finally, the fourth one is we want to introduce differential ev evolution as well to make sure that the neural nets doesn't get stuck in some kind of local maxim, uh, minimum, and then we want to kick the, the neural net into a space, into a, a parameter space that we haven't yet explored. So here's the sequence of what we're doing. We first give the experiment some training data. So the training data is done here, which is represented by the first 126 runs or so. So these are the training data that each of the neural nets will have to start off with. Then we ask artificial neural net one to guess what is the place to, for us to explore, to optimize. And then we hand it over to uh, the second neural net, then the third neural net, and then finally we give it to the differential evolution and say, now go somewhere else to make sure that there is not another local minimum that's even better than before. And then we loop it back. And we will do that uh, 
uh, once uh, around the loop of the four panels. So once we got the cost function, we'll hand the results back to our experimental control system, which consists of the locking monitors. Um, you will only accept the data if everything stays locked, otherwise you throw your data away, of, of course. And then the experimental parameters is then uh, converted to analog signals used to control the trapping, the repump, and also the mod uh, coils. So here are the, the loop, and we do that uh, around 700 times to try and get the results. And the results is supposed to be given by this uh, 63 uh, element vector that informs us what to do. That's what I mentioned. So, so here's the experimental run from run one to run 600. And what is going to be shown on the left side is the trapping, detuning, the repump, detuning, and the coil uh, magnetic field that the neural nets decided to use. As you can see, it's quite crazy. They don't care about adiabatic assumptions. They just randomly pick what they would like. But what we can see now is that slowly you can see that the cost function is being driven down and down and down. At around 580, that's when they decided, we think we found the best cost function. And then they just keep, because of the uh, differential evolution, they just keep exploring different part of the parameter space, but they couldn't find anything. So the final results is uh, a plot that is shown by this diagram. Uh, so we have no atoms, so this is a bad parameter set, and then this is corresponding to a very high optical density. So if we follow all the blue lines, it means that's the experimental setting the neural net is asking us to perform for using, for trapping, detuning, repump, detuning, and also coil currents. So we notice that some of the data points are very, very specific. Uh, the two red ones, for example, you need to be at that data point to get very high optical density. And then certain data points are a bit kind of uh, unimportant. Uh, you can set the data point to anywhere for the, for the uh, yellow, yellow datas, and then you'll be able to still get relatively good uh, uh, optical density. So what we started off with is we keep the trapping detuning constant, we ramp the, detune, the repump detuning, and then the, we turn on the magnetic field current. This is what we usually do. I think, I guess most of the labs would be looking at implementing this. And what the machine is now telling us is, you should do this. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess we'll try it. Um, and you can see that it's, it's just going wildly from not having any, uh, uh, from the detuning from one end to the other. In fact, um, we suspect if we were to give the, the machine even more leeway by, by, by having the ability to tune the laser even more, the, mach the neural net would have asked us to, to go even more extreme than that. So it's hard to see that how this could actually give us a, a good result. Okay, and so this is um, what we've done uh, with the adiabatically ramping uh, scheme. We all understand what this is. This is just having the magneto optical trap and we slowly turn on the coil and, and sweep the detuning so that we can slowly compress it. And the machine gives us this result instead. So if you look at it, it's kind of blinking and it seems to suggest that there's some kind of uh, release and capture, but it's not quite, because there's three parameters and they're not really varying in any uh, uh, periodic manner. And then when we make a, a measurement of the optical density, we find out that the uh, human optimized versus the machine optimized uh, results, it is indeed true that the machine optimized results outperform the human one. So this is in spite of the fact that we have been working on this setup for five years, and there has been about 10 PhD students who spend five years of their time trying to optimize all of the setting, and the machine took about two hours and get better performances than us. So kind of the repeat of the stockfish versus uh, uh, alpha zero story, really. So the final result is that for, the hum for human, we obtain 
for this specific transition, I have to say that the optical density obviously is uh, very specific to the atomic transition that you look at. Uh, we, 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 we can get the best uh, OD of 530, and then after optimization, we got to close to uh, uh, 970. So what I would like to, to do for the rest of the five minutes that I'm allocated is to have a quick discussion on what's going on here. So on the left side is the facts that we, we know. Uh, what we have is a five-layer deep stochastic artificial neural net, um, and it has that many connections. Uh, the performance clearly has surpassed five years of human optimization for the whole group. Um, and what I would like to, to uh, emphasize is that the solution, although it seems chaotic, it's very robust. It doesn't vary from one day to the next day. In fact, it stays the same. You've got to implement this crazy thing. And then two weeks later, you check. It's still the same crazy thing that they ask you to implement. So it is really robust. And the sol solution, I've, I believe, is specific to a particular setup. So maybe it's the geometry. It's the way we wind the coil on the experiment. Um, and I don't think we can just give you the, the, the same solution and hope that your op magneto optical trap would behave exactly the same way. Um, so the experimental stability is really the, the key here. So the whole cycle that we have, uh, we set it up to a two hertz rep rate. Um, and then we have to wait for 10 seconds because we want to make sure that the machine learning doesn't have some kind of non-Markovian contribution. So we let the parameter run for a few times until they, they, they clear away the previous parameter sets before we say, okay, that is the cost function for this particular set of parameters. Um, so the limitation is in the number of parameters you can control, in the number of processes that you can control, is really the stability of your experiment. Uh, are you able to control all your experimental parameters stable enough? The neural net in our particular, particular situ situation can handle yeah, uh, 3,000 parameters easy. It is really not computationally limited. Um, the physics, uh, I think this is an understatement, is not fully understood. Um, so the more speculative point, uh, why do we think, why do we end up having neural net beating us? And I think the reason is that the neural net doesn't make any assumption. It doesn't assume sudden approximation or adiabatic approximation. It really has the true suck it and see approach, you know, unbiased, intrepid. And the decision-making process is also really, really quick. Um, and we notice a kind of linear convergence. This is compared to other type of uh, uh, nonlinear optimization where the increase in the number of parameters sometimes doesn't scale very well. This one, you almost have a linear scaling. Um, we're hoping that this could un uncover uh, new physics, and then we're hoping that we could get larger parameter sets so that not just the loading and the transient uh, schematic from the schematic diagram, not just that two processes, uh, are machine optimized so that we can op machine optimize from the beginning all the way to the end of our gradient echo memory. Um, for that, I'd like to thank your attention. <laughs>